let's do that. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crusading Against Ignorance. Today, have a very special, and they're always special, but uh, yet another one for you today, an interesting debate. We're going to be talking about the success of science and whether or not it counts for or against Christianity and maybe some points about theism in general. So I'm um, joined by two special guests, Dr. Zachary Ardern, who's a molecular biologist in New Zealand, I believe. If I butcher anything, you guys feel free to correct me. And Ben Watkins, who's a nuclear engineer, and some of you may recognize as one of the co-hosts of Relay Theology. So uh, very happy to have you guys both here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here. And if one of you wants, if you guys want to say anything introductory about yourselves, your work, anything you want to plug, um, go ahead right now, starting with you, Ben. You got anything? Uh, yeah, so uh, as you said, I am one of the hosts of Real Atheology, a philosophy of religion podcast, where we explore questions in the philosophy of religion from non-theist points of view. And one of the things that we're trying to accomplish with our project is to try to see what our religious concepts might look like um, if we reject something like perfect being theism. So a lot of people think that being a non-theist means that religious concepts are just kind of defunct and have no more use or proper place in our life. And so we want to try to explore that a little bit and maybe try to push back on it and see what religion might be able to evolve into, even once we've rejected something like the traditional monotheisms that we find in the Western world. Okay, thank you. I like it. So yeah, if, if everybody hasn't gathered already, as you'll know from Ben, we'll have Ben representing the uh, the atheist side here and, and Zachary representing the theist slash Christian side. You wanna say anything introductory, Zachary? Uh, sure, yes. I'm uh, an evolutionary biologist actually in Germany at the moment, but originally from New Zealand. My background's um, in philosophy and uh, biology. And I guess my interest is in developing a natural theology, which uh, fits with what we know about evolution. So yeah, those are my some of my main interests and I've done various debates and uh, such. And I'm looking forward to today. Thank you. So my, uh, yeah, yeah. If you guys want to see any more of Zachary after this, if, um, or both of these guys, you can just Google their names on, look at their names on YouTube. They both have quite a few discussions online already. So uh, we're just adding to the pot for both of them. So that's great. So as far as structuring, this is going to be relatively loose and open, going to let them go kind of wherever they want to. Um, but I believe to start, Ben, you wanted to have a little bit of an opening. So we'll just turn it over to you at this point and uh, yeah, go from there. Yeah, so I want to turn my focus um, tonight to religious and secular disagreement about science and ethics. So I want to argue there is disagreement concerning the content of our beliefs such that uh, what the world is like and how we ought to act. I refer to knowledge of what the world is like as science, and I will refer to how we ought to act as ethics. I will use the term atheism to refer to the view that there is no perfect being that cares about the content of our beliefs, and the term theism to refer to the view there is a perfect being who cares about the contents of our beliefs, such as the God of Christianity. I'm limiting theism here to Christian traditions only because it's the tradition Zach and I are most familiar with and is most relevant to our discussion here. But it should be noted that my broader reasoning about theism also applies to the other Western traditions, such as Islam and Judaism, that are included within the theological concept of perfect being monotheism. But what is this broader reasoning that I'm appealing to? I want to start by noting that disagreement about science and ethics has not remained constant through history. We move closer to the truth by resolving our disagreements using reasoned argument and empirical investigation. When we appeal to religious experiences such as revelations, tradition, or scripture, disagreement about science and ethics increases such that particular religious beliefs and the disagreements between them are historically contingent to specific times and places. However, when we appeal to the natural sciences and secular ethics, disagreement decreases. The methods, methods of the natural sciences and secular ethics better resolve disagreement price, precisely because we are moving closer to the truth. These successes in resolving disagreement afforded by the natural sciences and secular ethics, I will argue, favor the view I've called atheism and count against what I've called theism. Let's begin with religious considerations that could, in principle, favor theism. The pro two problems I first I want to I will first lay out and characterize how religious explanations increase rather than decrease disagreement about scientific and ethical questions. 
I will assume all parties to the discussion can agree the best evidence for particular religious beliefs must be first person experiences like revelations. People's deepest and most intimate religious beliefs obviously arise from their personal religious experiences and nothing could be more of an immediate religious experience than a direct revelation from God. If there's a perfect creator with a common purpose for us, then the shared revelation of that purpose would strongly favor three theism being true. Such an intersubjective experience would invite widespread consensus about the nature, content, and significance of that revelation because it would be closer to the truth. But that is not the case. Not everyone has theistic religious experiences. And most subjects of religious experience disagree about the fundamental nature, content, and significance of their personal religious experiences. We can call this the problem of inconsistent revelations. Religious disagreement about revelation is widespread across religious traditions. So scientific and ethical explanations that appeal to divine revelation increase our disagreement. As a matter of logic, inconsistent and competing religious beliefs could not all be true. Most of them must be false. If that's the case, then we know most people through time have, in fact, systematically deceived themselves or have been misled by some distorting influence within their form of life. As David Hume famously pointed out, unreliable evidence of testimony in support of things like miracle events are ordinary events throughout history. So we are also aware that humans have a psychological propensity towards the mar marvelous or towards wishful thinking. Most humans have lived their entire lives in a fundamentally mistaken form of religious belief and meaning. Additionally, those who have had theistic religious experiences are almost always primed either by an established religious tradition or extensive exposure to theistic scripture and forms of life particular to a certain culture. This makes religious beliefs geographically and temporally predictable. We can call these facts the historical contingency of religious beliefs. Religious explanations and justifications that appeal to tradition or scripture increase our disagreement. We should now be asking ourselves why we should expect religious explanations and justifications to play a role in scientific and moral reasoning. So I'll now turn my focus to this question. The next two problems I would characterize how religious explanations fail to live up to what we'd expect of them, while the natural sciences and secular ethics have moved us closer to the truth. Any true religious frame framework would play an integral role in the external understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. But there is no such scientific consensus about such religious explanations. In fact, the most widespread consensus is in science are secular because they make no reference to religious traditions, nor do they make use of any particularly theistic con concepts or assumptions. We can call these facts the secular success of the natural sciences. The natural sciences reduce disagreement, and they do so by moving away from religious explanations. This brings us to where Zach and I have substantially disagreed in, the, in past interactions, and this disagreement motivated our exchange here tonight. I've insisted on at least eight successes of the natural sciences, and I want to lay them out here too. The first is that biological evolution refutes special creation. For example, molecular biology, biogeography, and the fossil record count decisively in favor of common ancestry and against something like special creationism. We know Adam and Eve are not literal historical fiction, fit figures, nor do they explain the origins of Homo sapiens. The second is that cosmology refutes a six-day creation narrative. For example, the cosmic backwave, that microwave background counts decisively in favor of the Big Bang theory and against a six-day creation event. We know the cosmos was not created in six days. Genetics refutes intelligent design. For example, junk DNA and genetic defects in general count decisively in favor of evolution by non-intentional natural selection and against an intelligent designer intentionally manipulating genes for his divine purposes. We know Homo sapiens are not the product of intentional processes. Statistics refutes intercessory prayer. For example, empirical studies about the inefficacy of intercessory prayer count against the view that God answers our prayers to save the sick and dying. We know intercessory prayer does not work in these ways. The fifth is that physics refutes a young earth model. For example, radioactive decay and the light we see from distant stars counts decisively in favor of the universe being nearly 14 billion years old, rather than the six to 10,000 years old that a young earth creation model would suggest. We know the universe is billions of years old. 
The sixth is that geology refutes Noah's flood. For example, the geological column provides us with no evidence for a global flood whatsoever. We know there was no global flood. Neuroscience refutes immaterial minds. For example, mental activities such as memory, personality, emotions, and rationality are dependent or necessarily supervene, to use the jargon, on complex physical structures such as brains. We know human minds are physically dependent things. The last is anthropology gives us a better explanation for the origins of religious traditions, concepts, and widespread religious disagreement than does divine revelation. As we saw earlier with the problem of inconsistent revelations, we know that all of our current religious traditions have primitive origins with multiple evolutions and iterations through space and time. I insist paradigm shifts back towards religious explanations in all of these fields is highly unlikely. Wishful thinking even. Creation, creationism is not making a comeback. Intelligent design will not be finding its way into biology textbooks, and neuroscience will not be rescinding its eviction notice to substance dualism. The paradigm shifts I've laid out here are a testament to just how far from religious traditions secular scientific methods have progressed. We widely observe secular scientific explanations replacing religious ones, but we rarely, if ever, observe religious explanations replacing secular scientific ones. In light of this secular scientific progress, religious explanations often become ad hoc in the natural sciences because they must appeal to auxiliary hypotheses and motivated rationalizations to explain away the inconvenient facts of these paradigm shifts. I want to now turn my focus towards ethics to drive home my points about disagreement. God's perfect goodness is a reason to believe theists would leave, live significantly more moral lives than non-theists, because worshiping God would be a source of moral strength not available to non-theists. Additionally, being perfectly moral, God would be an infallible source of moral knowledge. However, moral intuitions vary dramatically on important moral issues of religious significance, such as war, abortion, the death penalty, and religious violence. Religious traditions pursue a variety of radically different ethical systems, and none of them seem to bear any more moral fruit than another. Again, our largest consensus is in ethics come from secular reasoning. We can call this the problem of religious moral disagreement. Secular ethics reduces disagreement about, the, about what we ought to do, because it does so by moving away from religious morality. I want to wrap up now by emphasizing the fact that disagreement is better resolved and moves us closer to the truth in science and ethics the more it appeals to secular explanations, such as reasoned argument and empirical investigation, rather than religious explanations like revelation, tradition, or scripture. The upshot here is that religious explanations increase disagreement by moving us further away from the truth. I insist this counts against theism because theism implies a concern for the content of our beliefs, how we know them, and the moral value of how we act. But if we assume theism is true, then it seems as if God has inconsistently or inaccurately revealed what he wants us to believe about the world, how he expects us to know these facts, and how he expects us to act in the world. But if atheism is true, then there is no perfect being who cares about the content of our beliefs, how we know them, nor the moral worth of our acts. Atheism provides us with a sufficient explanation of religious disagreement. We observe disagreement about the nature and significance of religious experience, according to the atheist thesis, because they do not correspond to a shared objective reality. Thus, inconsistent revelations, the historical contingency of religious beliefs, the secular success of the natural sciences, and religious moral, moral disagreement are much more likely on, or are better explained by, atheism rather than theism. And I'll go ahead and end there and give uh, Zach an opportunity to, I know I've laid a lot on the table there, so I wanna give him sufficient time to unpack. Um, and if you, if you need me to re, uh, lay any of the things back out or reference to it, just let me know and I'll, I have no, no issue going back over that. All right, thank you. And yeah, Zachary, however much, uh, however much time you wanna uh, go with this and he's got slides, so that's always helpful too. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very glad to be here and uh, the topic that uh, we agreed to discuss and I'm really going to focus in on is are the successes of the natural sciences evidence against theism. So to start with I'm super glad to be having this discussion uh, because I think truth is important. Uh, personally I think there's a strong cumulative case for Christian theism 
uh, which includes scientific, historical, and metaphysical facts. And I'm also, however, an evolutionary biologist, and uh, I'm really interested in discussing the relationship between these things. And the focus uh, today is really quite narrow on whether the successes of science constitute evidence against theism. So I think we can maybe go through the specific points that um, Ben listed uh, later uh, if we want to, but I think it doesn't, I think he, he realizes that I agree with most of those points because I'm not a young earth creationist, uh, for instance, and I don't think that most of them are very relevant to theism per se. I also won't be talking about ethics today because the, the focus is uh, really specifically on the successes of science. And I tried to, uh, on this slide, you can see, I, I tried to summarize how I think an argument from the successes of science uh, per se uh, might go uh, against theism. And we can kind of talk through, I guess, later whether uh, this is what uh, Ben thinks. Um, so something he's, he said before was that, um, uh, something along these lines that uh, scientific uh, explanations are increasingly replacing religious explanations. I think it's something along the lines of what I got here, what I've got here, that naturalism predicts natural causes, science finds natural causes, and therefore uh, the successes of science support naturalism or undermine theism. Um, he may not be ascribing to naturalism, I think something similar goes perhaps uh, with atheism. And this is an argument that's been made by Paul Draper amongst others. And so this is what I want to, to focus on just because I think it clarifies the, I, what I take to be the fairly standard argument against uh, theism from the success of science per se. I have a number of responses which I'll, I'll, I'll work through. Um, some questions I guess that I have is, is whether Ben uh, wants to ascribe to uh, naturalism or, or here just not to, to not theism. Um, because if, it, if it's just not theism, if it's just atheism, then I don't think not theism predicts natural causes. I don't think it predicts the success of science. And if instead we want to go with naturalism, then uh, we need to clarify what is naturalism. And if it's defined as whatever future science tells us is true, which is a fairly common definition of naturalism, then to me, there seems to be something circular here. Um, because on, on that case, naturalism would not be independently specified of the evidence that we're dealing with, and naturalism would become ad hoc. So whether we take the root of not theism, which I think doesn't predict anything particularly about natural causes, or naturalism, which is kind of circular, I think there's maybe a problem, but we can talk through that. In terms of this, uh, this general argument, I'd say that if science was just about showing that things have natural causes, and if having a natural cause excluded having a theistic cause, then I think something like this argument could work. Because natural causes by themselves maybe do fit better with naturalism than they do with theism. But what I want to say today is that science is not just about finding natural causes for stuff we already know about. Uh, it's far more interesting than the kind of overused uh, classic example of science showing that Thor isn't the cause of thunder. Science is doing uh, some more interesting things than that that I'll try and explain today. So there's three main lines of response as, as we've got on the slide that I, um, that I want to highlight, but there's some other responses that I, that I could give that I won't be focus on, focusing on that I'll just briefly summarize. Firstly, um, the hypothesis not theism or atheism doesn't predict very much. Uh, as I mentioned, for instance, it doesn't predict that things in the world have causes at all. It just predicts that if they have causes, then their causes are not theistic. Um, so I would say actually as a matter of history that monotheism actually helped to naturalize the world and helped to pave the way for modern science. Uh, monotheism helped to naturalize the world because it makes a distinction between the created and the creator, which was crucial in the development of modern science. And second point of contention, which we could discuss, is that what counts as a natural cause is often disputable. And I would say that many findings of modern science, things like fields and forces and wave particle duality or a cosmological singularity, I would say they don't really fit very well with what our people in the past would have meant when they talked about naturalism. So if naturalism has to constantly revise itself uh, to fit the scientific evidence, as I think it does, then the supposed scientific evident um, support uh, that science gives to naturalism, I think is not very interesting because naturalism is constantly chasing to catch up with how science uh, 
what science is saying about the world. And another thing that we, we could talk about is that strong scientific realism, which something like this argument that I have on the screen seems to rely on is highly contentious philosophically and doesn't to me seem like a natural fit with naturalism. So if we're going to, to make arguments from the success of science, I think we're going to rely on something like a strong scientific naturalism, which is highly contentious. But for the point of the debate, I'm willing to grant it because actually I think it does uh, flow out quite nicely from theism. So I'm happy to grant it uh, from my side. But the, the three points that I really want to focus on today are those that are up on the screen. Firstly, that theistic and natural causes are not competing, or usually not in any case. Uh, because there are different levels of causation, something can be both theistically and naturalistically caused. As such, finding a naturalistic cause doesn't take down a theistic cause, doesn't replace it. Most cases of natural causation are irrelevant uh, to the question of theism versus atheism or naturalism or not theism. Secondly, science uh, finds new facts. It extends the boundaries of what we know. It doesn't just find causes for what we already know. Some of these things that we find uh, plausibly fit better with theism than with naturalism. For instance, fine tuning or design arguments. So some scientific successes actually support theism. That's my second point. My third point is that science doesn't just find natural causes, but it gives natural explanations. And there's a difference between an explanation and a cause. An explanation is a human construct. And whether our scientific explanations are true or successful depends on an accommodation between our minds and the world. This accommodation between our minds and the true structure of the world is, I would say, unexpected given naturalism. And as such, scientific success as a general phenomenon supports theism rather than naturalism or not theism. Now, the classical example, I think, of a claimed success of science which, which counts against theism is evolution by natural selection. And I'll briefly illustrate my three main points with reference to evolution. So overall, I'd say I think it's a common mistake to consider evolution as simply the antithesis of creation. So Ben has said, for instance, we know Homo sapiens are not the product of intentional processes, but I would disagree strongly. I think we certainly do not know that Homo sapiens are not the product of intentional processes. So again, I'll be summarizing my three points with relation to evolution. So point one, naturalistic and theistic causes and not mutually exclusive, sorry, natural and theistic causes are not mutually exclusive. So God is omniscient and omnipotent creator can create and achieve his ends using natural processes. And for instance, the Bible teaches that he does in numerous places. There's many cases where uh, natural events are used by God uh, for his purposes. That the standard processes of evolution are compatible with God's guidance is broadly accepted among leading evolutionary theorists, such as the non-theist Elliot Sober. Finding a natural cause does not invalidate a theistic cause, as they can be and in the Bible often are the same thing. So uh, pointing to natural causes as replacing theistic causes is, is often uh, not uh, a strong argument. Secondly, uh, even if uh, natural and theistic explanations, so, so even natural and theistic explanations, not just causes are, often, are not necessarily contrastive, so long as the theistic explanation adds something useful. Uh, an example of this uh, that we can consider is that around us in the world uh, nowadays, uh, things are increasingly automated, and we increasingly see the products of design, which have been mediated by secondary causes. And we still, when we see these things, we still make a, the reasonable inference to intelligent causation, when we understand that the secondary causes had to be set up precisely in order to get the outcomes observed. So we can infer both design and mechanism as simultaneous non-competing explanations. And I think that we can do the same thing in the case of some evolutionary outcomes. So that was my, my first point that um, natural and theistic causes and explanations are not necessarily contrary. My second point uh, regarding science finding new things, science has discovered that life is much more intricate than could have been imagined in the 19th century. It's discovered the huge functional complexity of even a single bacterium, the multidimensional optimality of the genetic code, the complexity of the human brain. So science has discovered uh, to an extent, it's also discovered natural explanations in terms of evolutionary processes of some of these things. But these processes depend, for instance, on the prior fitness of the environment for life. Uh, this prior fitness includes uh, the well-known fine tuning and cosmology, but numerous other factors as well, such as the life-friendly properties of various biomolecules, the remarkable aptness of this planet for life, 
and the structures, the various structures of this world that allow for evolution. Evolution of complexity doesn't just come for free as soon as you have a biological replicator. And maybe we can discuss this further in the, the discussion later. Okay, but aside from these details, specific details of what science has found, one of the main successes of science has been giving us a big scale picture of the world. Science has shown us that the universe is both historical and law governed. So by historical, I mean that there's directionality in the processes of the universe that's seen in cosmology, geology, biology. And most worldviews historically have not believed in such directionality. So most worldviews, are not theism in other words, most of these have not believed in this kind of directionality, instead they've believed in either long-term stasis or cycles. Secondly, um, so, so uh, just to expand on that, the concept of the universe having a linear history is controversial among worldviews, but strongly affirmed in the Judeo-Christian one. And this has been argued in, in numerous um, uh, studies of the history of science, that this whole concept of uh, history in science was not uh, the, as obvious as we take it for granted to be now. And secondly, the universe is also law governed. And again, most uh, worldviews have not proposed the universe to be law governed in the way that uh, monotheism has. My last uh, main point is that discovering that a natural cause and fitting it into a true theory of the world requires that the world be accessible to us and that we have the con cognitive capacities and conceptual framework to understand the world, the difference between a natural cause and a natural explanation. For instance, the deep history of the world is remarkably accessible to us. The history of the cosmos is available to us through light, through electromagnetic signals from throughout the universe's history, uh, which uh, happens to depend on our location and time and space. <clears throat> so that's uh, the history of the universe and also the history of life is remarkably stored in biomolecules such as DNA. So these things are not uh, necessarily to be taken for granted, but maybe more importantly, is that our ability to create true scientific explanations of the world depends on its order and its comprehensibility. Its comprehensibility requires that it has, has a rational ordering and that we are set up so as to be able to find it. Our successes in areas far outside any cognitive tasks that we might've been evolved for are quite remarkable and depend on key intuitions, which we have happen to con happening to coincide with the fundamental structure of the world, uh, which seems rather surprising on naturalism where there was uh, no intention behind our key intuitions. Okay, so to summarize, any one, I would say, of these three main points that I've made, uh, that natural causes are not contrary to theism, that science finds new facts which can support theism, and that scientific explanation fits better with theism, I would say significantly undermines the broad kind of argument uh, from the success of science to uh, the negation of theism. And together, I think these three are more than enough as a response to it. All right, thank you. And so now we're gonna have Ben respond in our series of responses here. Okay, I wanna first point off, point out the fact that um, I am a metaphysical naturalist in the sense that I believe that causal reality is limited to the natural world, that the natural world is causally closed. However, I've not made any use of a naturalistic hypothesis tonight. Um, the claim that I made was that the successes of science and the other facts that I laid out, um, the things like moral disagreement, um, the historical contingency of religious beliefs, and the inconsistent revelations count against theism. That's the claim that I, I'm, I'm specifically defending tonight. So the only thing that I, the only uh, thesis that I need to make recourse to is just not theism. Um, now, how can I do that? I can make this inference in at least two, I can formulate it in at least two ways. The first being a likelihood evaluation and the second being an inference to the best explanation. So uh, to start with a likelihood ev uh, evaluation, we could let H1 be the view that there is a perfect being that cares about the content of our religious beliefs, how we know them and the moral worth of our acts. And we can let H2 be, my, be the, negation of that, the view that there is no such being, but rather a causally closed universe or a success of secular sciences, scientific explanations that don't make recourse to theistic assumptions. According to the law of likelihood, the observations that are the four observations that I laid out 
favor hypothesis one over hypothesis two. And so to recap what those were, um, the first fact was inconsistent revelations. The second was the historical contingency of religious beliefs. And the third was the success of the natural sciences. And the fourth was religious moral disagreement. So that's one way in which I can cash this inference out. The second being an inference to the best explanation. We observe certain facts about widespread disagreement. Again, widespread disagreement is the, is the datum that I'm trying to explain here. The movements to uh, away from disagreement and into disagreement. We observe certain facts about widespread disagreement. If there's no perfect being that cares about the content of our religious beliefs, how we know them and the moral worth of our characters and acts, then that would explain these facts. And that explanation would be better than any alternative explanations. Alternative explanations, such as a theistic hypothesis, would have to become ad hoc in order to explain these observations. Therefore, probably there is no perfect being that cares about the content of our religious beliefs, how we know them, and the moral worth of our characters and acts. So that brings us to the first objection that Zach laid out, saying that theistic and natural causes usually aren't competing. I think that the, the eight lines of evidence that I laid out directly contest this, that no, in fact, there are religious uh, explanations that are competing with scientific explanations. Now, he might not accept those religious explanations now, but that's because he acknowledges the fact that I'm laying out, the success of those secular sciences. The secular theories are what resolved that disagreement. It wasn't the religious explanations. The religious explanations actually increased disagreement. Things like biological evolution refuting special creation, that's a, that's a direct example of where a religious explanation is competing with one of the successful secular natural explanations. Cosmology refuting a six day creation narrative. Neuroscience refuting something like substance dualism. Statistics refuting something like intercessory prayer. This brings us to the second objection that Zach brought up, that science also finds new facts that, and that many don't support naturalism. Well, is that really the case? I'm not so certain that that's the case. So first, I don't need to support naturalism here. I just need to have these facts count against theism for my claim here tonight to go through. But just to entertain the naturalistic hypothesis, I believe one of the examples he used was the fine tuning data. The idea that the range of life permitting constants in the universe is very, very narrow. Well, theism doesn't actually say anything about the life permitting ranges of certain constants. We have no reason whatsoever on theism to expect God to care about the strong and weak nuclear forces and the ranges in which they fall. So I don't actually think that these facts count in favor of, of theism. What, what, what science has discovered is that there is some further mystery here, that there is something here that is surprising to us, and perhaps there is some deeper explanation to it, which brings us to the third uh, objection that Zach Mitch mentioned, because he thinks that things like cosmic order and cosmic comprehensibility are things that count in favor of, of theism. And I've granted that. I've used that as a premise in my argument tonight, that we would expect for religious explanations, this order and stuff to give us uh, knowledge and resolve disagreement. Things like revelation and scripture and tradition should be things that allow us to tap into this cosmic order. It's precisely because they fail that I think it counts against theism and what drives us to move beyond these religious traditions. So I think there's what he's, he referenced Paul Draper here and used Paul Draper's argument. Paul Draper has what's called a fallacy of understated evidence. And so I think that this objection understates the evidence here. I think that when we start to realize the successes of the secular sciences, when we take that fact into consideration, it's not so clear that these facts of certain parts of the universe being comprehensible to us actually favor theism over naturalism. 
In fact, we could even challenge the idea that the universe is intelligible. It might not, we aren't actually guaranteed answers to our questions in these domains. Famously, there is no unification of quantum mechanics and cosmic relativity. There may never be a, you know, such a unification because such a unification might just be beyond the human capacities of rationality and empirical in inquiry that we evolved through natural selection. Quantum mechanics is notoriously difficult to understand. Perhaps there isn't some rational structure in quantum mechanics that would allow us to understand what the, the, the actual true compete, uh, theory of quantum mechanics is. Perhaps there's only just disentangled forms of information and understanding. We don't know. We have been successful in our scientific pursuits, but we've been successful precisely in our movement away from religious ex explanations. What we would expect from a theistic hypothesis is not what we observe. And I think that's how it counts against theism. I'll, right, go, I'll, so, I'll turn it back over to, to Zach now. Yeah, so Zach's gonna respond to that and then I think we'll, uh, we can open it up from there. And again, anything you guys wanna riff off of more, feel free to go ahead. So yeah, Zachary. Yeah, so I guess I feel like we've mostly been talking past each other so far. So hopefully Micah can help us to uh, to to engage a bit more, I guess, on on the the some of the specific questions around the successes of science. Um, so I guess my impression is that Ben seems to be really driven here by a focus on revelation, and and that theistic <clears throat> that theism is, is closely idea, um, tied to the idea of revelation, uh, which which may be the point, which which may be true, but um, that's really not what my focus has been. Um, my focus is on presenting a natural theology from um what we see in, in, in science and uh, i don't think that most of the claims uh, that were listed regarding um young earth creationism for instance are really relevant to the hypothesis of, of theism um so I, I don't think it's problematic that i, I reject those um and I, I accept that the reason i reject them is as partly because of scientific uh, explanations it's also partly because i don't think that they're necessitated by the text um but that's I think not really the topic of the debate today, which is more about a broader concept of theism rather than the specifics of any particular revelation. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about these other topics like ethics and revelation and stuff, but for today, I really want to focus on in what way, what is the argument from the successes of science um, to the negation of theism? Is it really, is it just from uh, certain successes of science undermining certain uh, presumed uh, purportedly revealed claims of theism, or is, is there a broader sense in which, which, so my impression was that there seems to be some broader sense in which Ben thinks uh, the successes of science uh, undermine theism. I, I guess I wanna unpack that and explore that because I, I think the responses that I've given do, uh, do respond to that quite well. Um, so I think there is a, a general, I think it is generally true that things in the world that have a natural cause um, don't necessarily not also have a theistic cause. Now, I don't think that's been responded to really adequately yet. I certainly don't think the fine tuning argument was adequately responded to um, because I mean, the point of the argument is that um, the extreme probability of, is that we observe scientifically what appears to be an extreme probability of life and naturalism basically takes, as far as we can tell, it takes its probability from the sciences um, naturalism, it seems on the naturalistic picture, life is extremely improbable uh, regarding the initial conditions and pr fundamental parameters of cosmology. But theism is, isn't bounded by these. Theism is, is determined by uh, God's intentions. And we have some reason to think that God might like life. On naturalism, we have no reason. Um, so the scientific evidence, which uh, suggests that, natural, that on naturalism, life is extremely improbable, um, I think supports theism over naturalism. That's the the point of the fine tune, I don't think that was adequately responded to. And the third one, I think maybe we can unpack with Micah a bit more is that uh, this whole idea around the comprehensibility and, and uh, whether that fits with theism, um, better than naturalism. I guess I'd also wanna unpack whether Ben is a scientific realist and how he sees that uh, relating because kind of towards the end, he kind of seemed to be stepping away from scientific realism. 
um, if that's true, then, then some of the other things might also uh, kind of uh, be pushed under the bus. So I'm looking forward to discussing some of these details and uh, onto Micah. All right, thank you guys both for the introductions. Yeah, um, I guess before we get into the more, some of those more specific things he was talking about, it may be helpful to have Ben kind of clarify a few points to um, maybe put us back in a better discussion space. So. I think part of the point Zachary's making is that some of the thing you guys, well, it's helpful always, uh, as Josh Rasmussen would say, if you were here to highlight our agreement. Um, so I think Zachary mostly agrees with a lot of the points in that those certain successes of science call it refute a kind of interpretation of Christian theism or of revealed religion, uh, but they don't count against theism simpliciter. So for example, we don't have to give up. And, and I think this is a good point too, because say I take the example, I mean, there's a lot of examples of most, there's not really any Christian philosophers that are committed to say something like young earth creationism or a young universe. And famously, uh, this isn't exactly a popular opinion, but Peter Van Inwagen is a materialist about minds and persons. So uh, I think part of the point Zach's making is that um, a lot of what you've said so far, Ben, is compatible with theism in a more uh, in a broader sense, not restricted to say certain Christian interpretations. So um, maybe if we back even to just perfect being theism itself, as opposed to Christian theism or a Christian theism that's more philosophical or it's been um, more compatible with science. So I think part of the point is just that some of those scientific findings are not incompatible with, with Christianity and they don't undermine Christian theism. Say, for example, the point about physical dependence of minds. Well, if you're Van Inwagen, who's a Christian and a physicalist, you can just say, sure, I agree that, you know, we're not, we shouldn't be substance dualists, but I'm still a Christian. And like so with lots of the other points, I mean, about um, evolution. I mean, we can, if we wanted to go into the, the weeds on the genetic dispute between the genealogical Adam and Eve, we could, but I think there's quite a fair number of, of Christians who, who don't accept the Adam and Eve account or anything even like it. They agree with common descent and the full evolutionary picture. And they believe, I guess, that somewhere in the process, um, call it insolment, if you will, there was the, the distinguishing difference between Homo sapiens and the rest of the creatures. But um, so I, I guess the what, what to do here for the dialect to move forward is just to ask Ben to, to clarify a bit some of these points. I mean, because uh, they don't seem to count against the kind of theism Zachary's um, espousing, at least, um, and maybe, or maybe you think modified versions of your objections do count against theism simpliciter. So if you could just, I don't know, maybe clear up uh, your view or your objections there for us a little bit. Sure. So um, I think this is a really, really important point because there is a broader reasoning that I'm using here um, that applies to something like theism simpliciter. Um, and I've used examples from the Christian tradition just because that's the one we're most familiar with and that's relevant to our discussion here tonight. So the point that I tried to lay out in my opening was that any true religious framework, um, and that would include a theistic simpliciter, would play an integral role in the external understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. And so Zach mentioned one of the ones that I had mentioned in my opening was revelation. But I also appeal to things like tradition and scripture. And so we can use any examples from any of the traditional monotheisms to make this point. The point is, is that we, we don't use those to discover how the world is, what it is like. When we try to use those means, those conceptual tools, those methods for discovering truth, they increase our disagreement. They move us further away from the truth. That's surprising on theism. So theism simpliciter implies that there is a perfect being that cares about the content of our beliefs, that cares about how we come to know those beliefs. This is why religious explanations held sway for so long through history is because of course, God is giving us the tools to know him better. He's those tools being things like revelation and scripture and tradition. And it's precisely the failure of those methods that I'm appealing to here. That's what's, that's the datum, the observation that's surprising on theism. That's not what we would expect on theism. And you mentioned Peter Van Inwag. And his, Sorry, can I actually, maybe yes, just go interrupt. ahead. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, well, just can we clarify, how does, how does this relate to, so as I understand, the, the data that we should be looking at is the success of science. Yes. So the successes of, of the, the secular successes of science, that's the data. That's 
That's the P, that's the fact that is counting against theism. We would expect for religious explanations to play a role in that scientific success. But the success is precisely secular. We only see the success when those explanations move away from religious explanations. It's that very movement away from it, like that we got from the Enlightenment. Now, you, you said that you can, you, we can contribute this to distinguishing between the creator and the created. I'm saying that no, it's when we remove this theistic notion of a perfect creator that cares about the contents of our beliefs and how we come to know the world and better know him. It's when we do away with that idea, move away from that idea, that we start to see disagreement reduced. We start to see a movement closer to the truth. And I think that's the fact that counts against theism. And I don't have to say anything about naturalism about this. Okay, yeah, so I, I think this is really interesting because um, I, I think this is, this is a common uh, kind of line of argument. And uh, my, under, my impression of it is that it, it really focuses on um, the theistic explanation being kind of a literalistic uh, biblical interpretation. And basically, okay, theism gives us this uh, set of instructions. We compare the, or a set of claims about the world. We compare those claims against the world. We find they're false scientifically. Therefore, theism is gone. That seems the, the kind of argument. And I guess, um, to me, this seems quite, quite an unsophisticated approach, which doesn't really grapple with how Christians throughout history, uh, from the very early church onwards, are really... Um, philosoph um, philosophizing about their, their Christian faith. They have a worldview, not just a kind of bare uh, list of a hundred instructions in a book somewhere, and not just a list of, of claims in a, a book about empirical reality, but a, a broader worldview, which says, what's the structure of the world? And I think that worldview, that theistic worldview, that Christian theistic worldview, uh, actually contributed in lots of ways to the history of science. So the concepts of laws of nature, has been argued um, by various people, like the concepts of, that there's various aspects of this. There's the orderliness of the universe. There's the comprehensibility of the universe. There's the fact that the order is expressed in terms of laws. Um, that whole concept of laws comes from the idea of God as lawgiver. Uh, the concept of testability in science has some theological underpinnings as well. So all this has been argued by various historians of science like Peter Harrison. It's not just a matter of, okay, we have this simple list of claims in a book, we go and test them, um, yeah, that, that's just an approach to kind of Christian or religious uh, knowledge about the world that is, isn't really accurate. Uh, from the very earliest church, these were philosophers engaging with the Greek philosophers and um, arguing a Christian worldview makes better sense of the world in, in a big picture sense. So yeah, th there's a lot there in terms of the like doctrine of creation, um, the kind of systematic theology, the ph Christian philosophy, uh, which can't just be dismissed with, okay, well, this uh, literalistic claim doesn't doesn't fit. Um, also, I mean, the way that Genesis was interpreted, we could also discuss that. It, it wasn't really interpreted in this literalistic way. But yeah, maybe Micah wants to comment, or maybe we go back to Ben. That's up to you. Yeah, um, I'll say something briefly. I mean, that's a good point too. I mean, the literalist interpretation is actually fairly recent. Um, I I don't know. Maybe I, let, let me say this and if, see if this is um, what your guys' disagreement is. Maybe some of, part of it at least has to do with the predictions that theism makes. Um, Ben, maybe do you think that, say, theism predicts more of a unification of, of human knowledge across time and cultures, like there would be, you know, a perfect being? He, he said before a few times in this discussion that, you know, this perfect being would care about the contents of our beliefs. So uh, it would do something to secure our knowledge in a way that is accurate about the world, helps us make testable predictions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Zachary, you think maybe that theism predicts more so that we could comprehend the universe and we have certain tools for figuring it out, but we have you know, there's a little more work to do, right? So we have to uh, do things like natural theology and science as flow from the sort of gift from God of, of say, just being able to comprehend and understand the world. Um, so is that, is that like, a, you think a fair way to characterize your disagreement? At least part of it is about the predictions theism makes. Ben, you think it would sort of predict this sort of more continuous stream of secure knowledge. And Zachary, you disagree with that. You think that, I, I don't know how you'd exactly um, lay out your view, Zachary, maybe that God would let us figure some things out. That may be a more primitive way to put it, but I, at a basic level, is that one kind of disagreement we have going here? 
Yeah, I, I think, think so. I mean, I, I would be happy to say that God cares about our, our knowledge, but there's different levels of knowledge, I guess I'd say. So there's there's like, uh, he cares that we believe that in the, in the doctrine of creation, but he doesn't necessarily care about the uh, mechanisms by which the earth was created. I mean, that was not uh, something that the, the ancient Hebrews were interested in or had the had the tools to to comprehend if he if he'd given uh the, the picture behind my head to the ancient hebrews they they wouldn't have a you know they wouldn't have a great clue picture would, by the way not to interrupt, sorry to interrupt you but it's a great picture yeah it, 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 I, I love it um so i mean this this is particularly what i'm really interested in is the act of translation translating uh nucleotide um sequences and into, into proteins but the ancient hebrews weren't interested in that they were interested i mean the 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 questions that the text of Genesis 1 especially is intending to address is uh, how did we get here? Who made us? Uh, what does that mean in terms of how we should live? Um, what, what is the human being? And, and who are we uh, subsequently through our Genesis? Who are we as the people of Israel? That, that's what Genesis is, is intending to address, not uh, what molecules combine with what molecules to make what however many years ago. Uh, so they just yeah so god cares about our knowledge but the kinds of knowledge that he's interested in is not necessarily the kinds of knowledge that the critique is being aimed at so so that's where the disconnect is i think so i would like to uh first of all that, that, that i'm not assuming any sort of particular literalist interpretation of any particular theological text as, as micah pointed out it's the predictions that we would expect from theism that's driving this Reasoning. I just used literalist interpretations that have a more contemporary nature within the Christian tradition now, so things like young earth creationism um, as an example. But to move away from that, to give a more broader um, understanding uh, and to move back to perfect being theism, theistic simpliciter, and the expectations that we would have from some sort of hypothesis like that. Um, we've mentioned Peter Vanenwagen before and how he has a very unpopular opinion um, in uh, theistic circles that, yeah, we are physical things. Our minds are physical things. He's not a substance dualist. Well, why is that an unpopular opinion in those circles? Well, it's because theism predicts things like souls, that we have this immaterial mind that can survive our physical death into an afterlife. That's an incredibly theologically important part of theism. And it would be very surprising for that to not be the case. And we would expect for a perfect being to care about our knowledge of that. He would care, we would care about things like revelation and tradition and scripture would want to clearly give us that information. And in most Christian theists, I think would agree that it does do that, that we are not merely material things, that we are something above and beyond the physical world. And that, the, our essential personality characteristics are not, you know, things like memory and personality and emotions and our rationality, our, our, busy, our ability to make choices is not something that's limited or dependent on the physical world. Another example would be something like prayer. Maybe, so, go ahead. I wonder if it might be helpful to go through one at a time. Um, just yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah, so if, if, we, if we start with this one around, around minds, I think it's interesting. And I, I think we just can't conflate between dependent on and um, solely consisting of. The, these, are, these are two different things, right? So, okay, the, the, the mind, whatever it is, seems to be dependent on, in some sense, correlated with the brain, but it, it doesn't follow that the mind just is the brain. And there's all kinds of models that, uh, there's all kinds of different ways in the philosophy of mind that we could go about that. Um, but I, I just think it's, it's uh, it shouldn't really be controversial that um, the, the the flat claim that neuroscience uh, like proves materialism or something that that's just going way too far. There's very few who could sign up to that. Um, so well, and so that point because I, I totally agree with you. So I'm a non-reductionist in the philosophy of mind. So I'm not. My argument is not that neuroscience entails the idea that mental states are identical to physical states. That's not my argument at all. My argument is that all known mental activity has a physical basis in physical complex physical structures, things like brains, and that the best explanation for this is given to us by something like neuroscience. The okay. is neuroscience, 
that the mental activity necessarily supervenes on physical properties, that the mental and the physical are necessarily dependent on each other. You can't have mental activity without physical activity as well. So the idea of a disembodied mind, the idea of mental activity purely independently of any, anything physical is not supported in the slightest by any of our findings in neuroscience. In fact, our findings in neuroscience are exactly the opposite. I would say, um, you know, all known mental activity is correlated with physical differences in embodied brains. Damaging a brain can impair mental functioning and psychological capacities like personality, memory, or the capacity to have any conscious experiences at all. Why does physical damage to a brain have any effect on mental functioning if mental functioning can exist independently of that physical structure? Additionally, the impairment of certain physical or psychological capacities is correlated with damage to specific regions of a physical brain, things like dementia. Why is there this strong correlation? And so we get these facts from neuroscience. And I think these facts strongly support the, 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 the hypothesis that mental events necessarily supervene on physical events. That doesn't mean that they're identical with it. I agree with you there. I don't support, I don't subscribe to that claim myself. Okay, so so I would respond to that that the leap to necessity is is a big step. So it's very hard um, from an, you know some kind of inductive inference from science to to make a leap to necessity in general. So so this metaphysical claim about um, necessary supervenience of non physical on, on on the physical, I I, I think that's uh, that's a tricky case to make, and I I I, I don't think that's going to be made very persuasively. Um, and um, even even if that was the case, I'm not sure that that would actually be a challenge for for theism, particularly Christian theism, which believes in the resurrection of the body. So I, I don't think Christian theism requires that there be, at least in the cases of humans, that there be uh, kind of separate, separable uh, mental uh, substance, or or um, yeah, that there be separable mental substance. Um, I think it, it does entail that God is in some sense a, a separate non-physical mental thing, but it, but I, I don't see any way that we can really extrapolate from data about neuroscience to the, to invalidating the possibility of some kind of non-mental, uh, sorry, non-physical mental reality. So I, I just, I think there's just a gap in the argument that making the leap to necessity is a really strong one and science doesn't, doesn't do that. Uh, science is inherently inductive in its, in its method and uh, conclusions. Well, so I'm not ruling out the possibility here. So I am making an inference to the best explanation. I've, I've laid that out at the, at the, at the beginning. The, the best explanation, though, the conclusion that I'm saying, what I'm saying is most probably the best explanation is that mental events necessarily supervene on physical events, that you okay. can't have one without the other. I'm saying the evidence that we have right now counts in an inductive way, like you're saying, toward in favor of this hypothesis. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and grant you that this is not a deductive argument. I'm not trying to deduce this from considerations to get the, that, that, that necessarily entail this. I, I completely leave open the possibility of a disembodied mind here. And I think we could have evidence for mental activity that is independent of a physical structure. And I think such an observation would count in favor of a disembodied mind. I don't know if you've seen the um, first season of the Netflix show. Um, shoot, why can't I think, that, think of the name? It's Stranger Things. Have you seen the first season of Stranger Things? Well, there's a scene in it where one of the characters goes to what they call the upside down, which is this non-physical realm. And that he communicates with his mother in the physical realm through Christmas lights hung on a wall. And so she's able to infer the mental activity from the blinking lights. Of, and so that would be mental activity from this non-physical netherworld they call the upside down into the physical world. There would be mental activity outside of an embodied brain. That would, I mean, something, I mean, there, there are observations in principle that would undermine the inference that I'm trying to make here. Right, and I, I would say that's exactly what the arguments from natural theology do, uh, both the arguments from natural theology and also the arguments from history, for instance, the, for the resurrection of Jesus. 
uh, these do provide evidence of some kind of, um, I would say, non non material uh, causation, either creating the world or or active in it. So, yeah, but 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 I kind of worry that we we that we're kind of going off off topic. We got the, the specific point I really want to focus on is that the successes of, of science in a more general sense. Um, because uh, as Micah has said, um, within theists, there are different models of how you relate to the mind to the brain. Um, and I'd, I mean, we could we could try and delve into the philosophy of mind a bit, but I, I don't know if that's too- Let's use another consideration, the one that I was, I was hinting at earlier um, and coming back to predictions that the, theism would make, something like intercessory prayer. Mm -hmm. so another example. So intercessory prayer, if we were in our studies that we've done on this, if we were able to see causation at a distance in the sense of people's prayer having effect on them, healing capacities, people who were sick were getting better because of disembodied mental activity, intentional dis disembodied mental activity brought on by something like prayer. Again, this is a way in which what I'm saying would count in favor of something like souls, immaterial minds, and theism more broadly. Mm -hmm. but again, it's, it's precisely these areas where we see them fail. We see them not, what we expect from theism is not what we observe. Revelation, scripture, tradition teaches that things like prayer have these sorts of effects. And it's only when we move away from those explanations that we begin to have success. When we start to see that Maybe there aren't these things like disembodied minds, because these things like intercessory prayer just don't work. So, I mean, there's, there's obviously various commentaries um, by Christian scientists and statisticians and such on the intercessory prayer stuff. So if people are interested in that, they can, they can look it up. And there's a nice one from, uh, I've forgotten his name, but he's a former uh, head of the Royal Society of Statistics in the UK. And he, he just makes, he makes various statistical points um, but I mean, the, the key kind of philosophical point is just that God is not uh, a simple variable uh, in, in the scientific sense. And when you're dealing with persons, uh, it's harder to make these kinds of predictions. Um, so it, it's uh, also, it's very hard to have a negative control group in, in, this, in this kind of situation um, because God is not uh, blinded <laughs> uh, the whole, or like a, a double blinded control, which is kind of the gold standard of um, these kinds of tests. It's not possible because God is, is seeing the whole situation. Uh, and also the people who are supposedly not being prayed for, they are probably being prayed for by other people. So it's, it's a really messy kind of situation scientifically. Um, and it's not clear that God is interested in, in kind of playing by these games uh, regarding um, giving a statistically significant result in, in, that, in that kind of test. So it'd be interesting if it happened, but the fact it doesn't happen doesn't really worry me that much because uh, it, it doesn't, it, it wasn't something I hugely expected because uh, God doesn't seem to be just from our other uh, experience of the world. God doesn't seem to be in the business of kind of broadcasting himself extremely obviously to everyone. I think it's a bit more subtle than that. You don't think that's surprising? I think that's very surprising that God is not open to making himself known in such ways like that. It seems to me that a perfectly loving God who wants to have a meaningful relationship, who cares about the content of our beliefs and our eternal salvation would want to broadcast himself in such a way. Uh, that, that, might, rising. That, that might be, I mean, this is kind of getting, I, I feel like we kind of keep going off in, in other directions, which are kind of whole other topics regarding divine hiddenness or uh, revelation or philosophy of mind, all, all this stuff is, I feel like it's off topic of the central question of the successes of science. Um, so we could talk about divine hiddenness, and I, I think there are reasonable responses to that and such. But um, and I think the natural theology gives us enough, basically, and, and also our, our, our conscience uh, gives us enough. Um, but but these are these are again different different topics. To but, I, but I think they're they're very importantly related because again, what we're talking about is what we would expect of theism. We're talking about the success not, of sciences, right? With regard to the success of science, and it's not not any. Um, any question around what we expect on theism, but what do we expect on theism regarding the success of science? Um, we would expect to, to find things like within our scientific methods that prayer does work and that mental activity is, can be separated from physical structures. I think that is, is something we could expect. And so I think that's why it is really important to the reasoning here, because 
I was uh, the first objection was, is you, was that I was I was committed to this literalist interpretation to some particular scripture, and I'm saying no, it's about the predictions that theism would make. And so, yeah, this this reasoning can also be applied to something like a problem of divine hiddenness. But you're making the claim you're 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 putting an ad hoc auxiliary hypothesis up here, saying, well, we really wouldn't expect God. You know, there's no reason to really expect for God to want himself to be discoverable like this. I don't think that's I don't think that's the case. I think we do. And I think that's why it counts against theism. I think why the reason that we have this success, the, this secular success, the very explanation that I'm trying to offer is that perfect being theism is false. And that is why we don't see these things. The evidence that we would expect is the evidence is precisely the evidence we don't find. And when we do find the truth, we've moved away from religious ex ex uh, explanations, things like revelation or scripture or tradition. It's by moving yeah. away from those that we come, we, we resolve disagreement and move closer to the truth. So I think it's very re relevant. Yeah, so I guess what I would say is that the structure of your argument kind of takes the successes of science for granted. You're, you're not trying to justify the successes of science. You just assume, okay, naturalism predicts the success of science. But the point of my argument is that naturalism do, or, or non-theism, however we want to flesh that out, it doesn't predict the success of science. So the success of science is counting against in, in this broad sense. So it might be, it might be that on specific points, the success of science seems to count against theism, say, or a specific kind of theism. I, I can certainly grant the success of science counts against certain kinds of theism, like it rules out young earth creationism. Some specific successes do do that. Uh, some of the other ones are, are more debatable because it just depends how you, how broadly you, you define the, the claim regarding mind body uh, dualism or, or relationship. Uh, if you don't have a kind of a really strict substance dualism, then I think the science is really not gonna be, well, even if you do, that there's, there's plenty of substance dualists who, who, who argue that that's compatible with science. Um, so that one is, is actually not so pr problematic. And, and the, the I mean, yeah. so there's the consensus in philosophy of mind and neuroscience is not substance dualism. You'll have to search far and wide to find a substance dualist in a philosophy of mind department or neuroscience department. Oh, it's neuroscience is a different question. I mean, they're not, they're not philosophers, but in the, in the philosophy of mind, there, there are plenty of people who hold to various different kinds of dualism. Very, very much an extreme minority. I mean, you have to search far and wide to find a substance dualist in a philosophy of mind department. Yeah, I, I think we can. I think we can probably grant that um, it's not super important. I mean, one thing um, that maybe it's defining how we're talking about success. Um, maybe for me, it'd be interesting to clear up. I'm not quite clear on, um, say, the inter intercessory prayer statistics as a success of science. As Zachary said, it seems to be more of a kind of an inductive statistical point, but it's not like a, a law or a finding. Um, but I, maybe since we're you know, we have limited time here. Um, we can turn back to, if you guys are okay with it, turn back to the fine tuning point. Um, Cause I think that'll put us kind of back a little bit more in the domain Zach's wanting to go as far as um, he thinks theism gives us more resources to even have successive science. And that would include, you know, us being in a hospitable environment to exist in the first place. So um, I think to, to bring it back to that point a little bit. Um, I, and I also think Zach, you wanted Ben to say a little more about the fine tuning point cause you wanted it responded to a little more extensively. Um, so maybe one way to make the case Zach is making about fine tuning is just that, you know, very simply put that theism has better resources to explain really, really improbable things than naturalism does. Because if you have naturalism, you have just say chance and just the resources we see. And so an improbability is, is just an improbability, but theism um, predicts an intentionality, say like an intentional mind that, that makes choices. And so Obviously, you know, in our normal our normal understandings of say chance or improbable events, it's easier to explain them, um, say on my action, and as opposed to like you know a tree falling, it it's easier to explain it if I chop it down and falls over by itself. Very primitive example, maybe it doesn't work if we dig into it, but I, I think the general point just being that maybe Zach wants to say theism has better resources to explain fine tuning. It has intentionality. It has minds. It has uh, this omnipotence to, to select and, and create worlds, whereas naturalism kind of has more of this chance process. So um, Zach, if you want to say anything else to kind of get us back in the direction you're wanting to go, but I, are you guys cool with talking about fine tuning for a bit here? For a second, yeah, at least. The, the, the point with fine tuning is it's the combination between improbability and some kind of specified outcome. And, and um, yeah, that, that, that's the point. So there's some there's some reason to think this. It's not just some weird thing happened, but there's some reason to think God could be interested 
uh, with some degree of plausibility in that in that weird thing. And naturalism is gives you no particular expect, uh, expectation regarding that thing. And I think, for instance, life is is a fairly clear example where theism gives you some reason to expect uh, something like life, whereas naturalism doesn't care either way. Um, but yeah, uh, Ben, feel free to to comment on that whole issue. Yeah, so um, I would want to appeal to what Paul Draper has called the fallacy of understated evidence here, um, because there's several points to, um, that I would want to challenge, say that I don't think theism has the resources to help us explain this um, mystery sufficiently. Um, first, we're, it's offering a disembodied mind as the explanation. This is, this is the very thing that we were just debating with, you know, neuroscience gives us evidence to think that there are no disembodied minds, but we'll put that, we're, we're shelving that for now. Um, but then again, there you, you mentioned that one of the things that drives the fine-tuning reasoning is that there's this specified happening, uh, life as we know it. Well, what's important there is life as we know it. So we know that if we change one of the fine-tuning, one of the const, uh, constants that we say is fine-tuned, ever, 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 ever so slightly, and we change our local conditions drastically. And so life as we know it might not be possible, but that doesn't mean that life in some other form isn't, or that if we adjust other constants is also, that we would also give rise to life permitting con uh, environments, life like ours, or maybe even radically different. They might sound kind of science fiction-y, but then again, the example here is changing the constants of the universe. So there might be some sort of explanation that's a combination of chance and necessity that helps us understand this fine tuning better. Um, and the point I mentioned earlier, um, and I want to really drive this home is, is that God is omnipotent. God can create life however he wants to create it. He doesn't even need to create it in a physical capacity. Most theists believe in something like heaven, which is life without any sort of physical constraint or constants. And so what we know is, is that the range that these constants can take is narrow. Theism provides us absolutely no resource to understand why that range is narrow rather than wide. Why think that God cares about the value of the cosmological constant or the strong or weak nuclear force? Is he limited in his power to creating life to these very, 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 very thin ranges for these constants? That seems to really underestimate God's omnipotence here. So I don't think that the theism provides us the sufficient explanatory resources to help us tackle this particular problem. That would explain why most cosmologists and most physicists still aren't theists, even though they're aware of fine-tuning data. It's because I just don't think that it provides us a satisfactory explanation here. I think there's still more work to be done here. There's still something we don't understand. There's some combination of chance and necessity that we just don't understand yet. Yeah, so I, I would say fine-tuning is not just about life as we know it. I, I think that's a mischaracterization. I mean, the the when you change some of these parameters, it's not just that you don't get a world exactly like ours, but that you don't get molecules, for instance. And good luck. I mean, if you can imagine some kind of life that doesn't require uh, interacting particles, then okay. But um, it's, it's not just a narrow sense of life as we know. So I, I don't think um, that's accurate. And also, I mean, there's lots we could say about fine tuning, but regarding why most physicists and, and such, um, I mean, a, a good number are, theists, of course, a, a large number are agnostics. Probably the number of atheists is the minority from what I've seen of, of studies of, of scientists in general. Um, but why, why do most of them not accept the fine tuning? Well, most haven't studied it. Uh, and those uh, who reject it usually don't reject the physical uh, facts about fine tuning. They don't say things like, oh, well, life could have been different. That's not the usual response. The usual response is something more like, well, a multiverse or maybe a theory of everything or some other, but they don't deny the, the, the uh, usually they don't really deny the, the central claims around the actual fine tuning, which is that if you do change the parameters, then it seems like you, you don't get a life permitting universe. 
Um, you also said that uh, God doesn't, God is omnipotent, so he's not uh, restricted. Um, so it might be that God could create in some other, some other way. He could create an instantaneous universe. He could sustain it, even though the laws that go contrary to, um, that he needs to keep interrupting the laws, for instance, so that they don't uh, destroy life. But um, I don't think it's um, hugely implausible to say that God could, at least could reasonably plausibly be interested in a stable universe that is governed by laws. And um, I think Christian theism is very compatible with that, that God uh, has a certain character and that he's faithful. And the, the way the Bible describes it is that the regularities of nature reflect God's faithfulness. Um, and this, the Bible was obviously written before we knew the, the details of, of, of the science here. Um, so I, I think Christian theism uh, fully predicts a regular uh, universe. And it turns out that when we, we do our scientific study, that the regularity is not just surface level, but it goes deep. It goes all the way down. Um, and it turns out that regularity is life friendly. And I think naturalism doesn't predict that at, at all. And uh, we can see that because the people who um, discovered these things like Fred Hoyle were hugely surprised by it, uh, who, who are not theists. So this is a genuinely surprising fact that nature is giving us that doesn't seem to fit very well with naturalism and seems to fit better with theism. And plenty of non-theist physicists admit that. Uh, for, they may have other reasons why they don't actually go all the way to theism. They appeal to some other uh, cause, but they do, it's widely accepted that this is surprising given uh, what they took to be the assumptions of naturalism. I'll concede that it's surprising and that that's indicative of a deeper mystery. But what I really want to focus on what, what it is that we're trying to explain. We're trying to explain why the life permitting range is narrow rather than wide. What reason does theism give us to think that the life permitting range would be narrow rather than wide? Does theism have a good answer for that? I, I think it's more just that um, uh, God has some reason to believe, to, 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 to want life to exist and naturalism doesn't. Um, we see that life exists and we see that sci scientifically, uh, if life is to exist, then uh, it's very improbable given naturalism. Oh, so I'll give you the, the, I'll grant to you that life is more expected on theism than it is on naturalism. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a fallacy of understated evidence here. You know, life is, you know, biologically evolves. I think we have more reason to expect that on naturalism. And more well, I don't think that's a fallacy. I think it's just when you look at evidence, you need to look at one piece at a time. And, and the, the way fair. to... That's, that's, the way that's to but the, the, data data we're trying to explain, the data we're trying to explain in the fine tuning is why that life permitting range is narrow rather than wide. Do we have an explanation from theism? That's, that's what we're trying to explain. That's the thing that's supposed to count in favor of theism. How does it count in favor of theism? Why is it narrow rather than wide? Yeah, I, I, I'm not so sure that that is the, the I think it's, the, it's like the conjunction of life exists and, um, and it turns out to be highly improbable on our best scientific theories. Uh, so I, I don't I'll think give, it's- I'll give you that it's improbable on naturalism. I've not appealed to naturalism in my reasoning tonight. I've appealed to how the successes of science count against theism. You're retorting by saying, well, here's a datum that counts in favor of natural of theism. I'm saying it doesn't count in favor of theism. How does it count in favor of theism? If it did, it would explain why this life permitting range is narrow rather than wide. How does it explain that? So I, I gave this in the context of a bunch of different design arguments. And I, I think it's just, uh, I think all of these design arguments uh, do count in favor of theism rather than natural. So for instance, the um, uh, the fitness of the environment for life. This is also a kind of fine tuning argument uh, that uh, the environment, whether it be at the level of physics or chemistry or biology, uh, seems to be set up in a, in a very precise way that enables life. Um, and, and this is- Narrow huge... rather than, than, than wide. I'm, I mean, I'm granting you that, I'm giving this. The, the, the question is, why are those parameters narrow rather than wide? Why does God care what those parameters, the, the width of those parameters? Why does he care to make them very, 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 very thin rather than wide? 
I, I don't I don't know if it's a matter of God caring for them being thin run. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to make much progress here because it's... I think that's exactly what we need if we're going to say that this data counts in favor of theism. We're going to need some reason for this to not be surprising, to be expected. And I don't, theism, I don't think theism gives us that at all. So you, you don't think that theism would, a God would want to, to show his existence? Uh, in, in terms of, I do think he would want us to show his existence. But why I think... Theists have always made design arguments. And this is just sure. an... A, a, a teleological the, argument. I will grant you that this, this is a teleological argument. And what I'm, what I'm looking for, you're, you, you, you appeal to the surprisingness of these facts. People go, wow, this is surprising. And so my understanding of explanation here is that theism is going to make this less surprising. This fact of the, the parameters, the width of the life permitting parameters, it's going to help us make sense of that. I right, just because, don't see it. Right. So... So Ben, you're... Sorry. Sorry. No, I, so Ben, is your point that um, you think theism would predict or should give us a reason as to why the parameters themselves would be narrow? Um, Rather than why, yes. Yeah. So I'm granting to him that life is more predictable on theism. God would care about creating life and life. Would so God would care about life simpliciter, but why would he care yeah, about this I, I specific get that. form? I, like like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to grant that life itself, the existence of life, counts in favor of theism. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. But what's life, the, the, the existence of life was already a data. That's not something that science has gone and discovered. What science has discovered is that the life permitting ranges, of certain parameters is narrow rather than wide. So, the, the, so I guess what I wanna say is that, um, sorry, it took me a while to think of this, but the, I think what I wanna say is that the reason that life is evidence for theism is just because this life permitting range is narrow. Well, I mean, otherwise, why would you be willing to grant that life is, is evidence in favor of, of theism? It's because life is improbable. God wants to have a loving relationship with the creation. God is perfectly loving. And no, no, no. the question is why is life improbable on naturalism? I'm not, I'm not appealing to naturalism here. We're saying, you're saying that this finding counts in favor of theism. I'm saying that the successes of science count against theism and you're retorting in this dialectical and saying, no, there are, there are findings of science that count in favor of theism. Mm -hmm. And one of these findings is not just that there's life, but that the parameters for life are narrow rather than wide. Right. And so what so I would say- Explained by theism. Right, so what I would say is, yeah. So what I would say is that when we find these parameters are narrow rather than wide, we find that life is really improbable. Uh, that, that's what we're finding, uh, and that's that's the that's what we, that's what because okay, then then we say okay well naturalism is limited to the findings of science it seems on naturalism life is improbable but on theism we're not exactly we're not restricted to this uh, I've already granted that natural life is surprising on naturalism and it's but the not only reason it's surprising is because I've already granted that no 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 I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to explain to you why you're agreeing to that. It's implicitly because <laughs> the range is narrow rather than wide and in all these different ways, not just the fine tuning argument, but also there are-, there are uh, so The best I think you could get from that is that life is very, very, very improbable on naturalism. Mm -hmm. And okay. that's, it's not improbable on theism because we already- Why is it not improbable on theism? Well, you've already granted that, that God would be interested in loving relationships and, and such. Um, but the point is that God is not restricted to. No, 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 no. no. I've, I've, but th that's life. But we're to, again, we're we're talking about the narrow parameters. Why is that not surprising? Or, or what, how is that less surprising on theism? How does theism give us an explanation? I grant that it's giving us an explanation of why there is life rather than non-life. Right, but the thing is, we don't know how improbable that is on natural relationship with it. But why is that the the discovery of science? Of the fine tuning is the narrow range. How right, so does that it yeah, better explain by theism? I, I think I've already explained that the, the discovery of science is that uh, if you're a naturalist before, you're not sure how improbable is life. It could be that you find life in all the universes. You know it's improbable because no, naturalism no, no. doesn't predict life. Naturalism is a non intentional process. Right, so but you don't know what the universes are going to be like. So, so the point is that you do your science. And you realize, oh, wow, when you change these parameters, 
uh, now, when you change the parameters, then you don't get life. You change so another one way, parameter. When you change one, but we don't. So actually now you're changing the topic. Now you're trying to say that the fine tuning doesn't exist. God, <laughs> whoa! Where did I say that? You're saying I'm saying if you change one of those parameters ever minusculely, you will change our local conditions very radically. But that's not. The, what if I change multiple parameters at the same time, not just one? Yes, so we that have they, no they, idea what that looks like. No, they they do that as well. So Luke Barnes, I. I I'm surprised you don't know this, I guess, but Luke Barnes in his book discusses this as one of the standard objections. Have you read his book on? I have, Luke Barnes, yes. Yeah, so he, he discusses, it's a common objection that you're just changing one at a time, but he says, no, that's not what we're doing. Um, so the, the, they are changing multiple parameters and, and they, they find that it's a consistent finding across these different parameters that life is, 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 is rare in the possibility space. And, and, and the point is that um, this is a finding of science. And, and so that means that for the naturalist, life ends up being improbable, but they didn't know that beforehand. They didn't know that before the finding of science. Um, I mean, if people want to go into this, they can go into the literature and it, it's an ongoing debate. Um, and and it's a, uh, this is also something specifically on the, the narrowness of the range that um, John Hawthorne uh, talks about uh, in, in, in some talks, which I recommend. He has a great, yeah, he has a very great book. It is a very great book to recommend. Yeah, so what, what I, yeah. Um... It was just towards the end there. I, I think I finally sorted out what the disagreement was, and I'd love to go into it. What this has shown me the last few minutes is it'd be fun to have you guys on for a top a video just on fine tuning sometime. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I, it, it took me a while to get that because um, I'm not really thinking about. Fine I could. Tuning. I probably could have made it more clear from the beginning. So I'll certainly take some some blame in that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of complicated factors with with fine tuning across a range of issues in science, and I I would let you guys keep going, but we're reaching we're reaching our, our time limit for um. For Ben, and I think we'd probably wrap, better to wrap it up for Zachary too. So, um, but if you guys, yeah, just let me. If you guys would want to do just something on fine tuning, that'd be interesting. But um, well, as for now, statement. So I think it would be best to to let Zachary have the have the last word. Here. Yeah. So if you guys want to take two three minutes and, and kind of summarize your I'll, cases, I'll let them go ahead and give closing closing remarks. I think that's dialectic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sounds good. Right. I guess let's just open up that there's so many different issues. I mean, there's issues around. Uh, specific claims of specific religions. And, and I fully agree that some of these claims interpreted in a certain way definitely are uh, disputed or counteracted or, or, or refuted by science. That, that's definitely for sure. Um, I guess I'm more interested in the broader sense of, well, is this still a, you know, is this still a uh, defensible Christian theism or theism of some kind? Um, and in my view that there's a bunch of things in science and of the nature of science itself, which do seem to uh, support theism quite well in terms of various kinds of design arguments, uh, not just the fine tuning and cosmology, but what I'm more focused on is uh, design arguments that are compatible with evolution and, and biology. Uh, but also, so th there's all of that stuff. And there's also the whole question of why we can do science in the first place, the orderliness of the universe and the comprehensibility. And we only just kind of touched a little bit on these things. So th there's a massive area um, one book I'd like to plug uh, on, on some of this stuff is, um, uh, I think it's called More Than Matter, and it's by Roger Trigg, and uh, it's just really short, and it, it really explains, uh, in a purely secular way, actually, the metaphysics of science, but it does in, it in a way where implicitly you start to see that theism actually, yeah, he's a Christian, actually starts to make sense of these things. So that's, if people want to look up on um, more into the nature of science, I'd go there. And also for the history of science, I'd go with Peter Harrison. And there's a whole discussions there around uh, Christian influences on the history of science. The only okay. insidious plug that I'll give is Hegel's phenomenal, Phenomenology. I'll go ahead and plug that one. Oh man, how did he get Hegel in there? That's what I was- I had to get him in there somehow. One of my notes for the debate was prevent Hegel, so I failed as a host here. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no. So I think it's dialectically important to point out a few things as we close here. Just that this is complicated. We've opened a can of worms as far as just basically almost every area in philosophy of religion here, doing with with mind, philosophy of science. We didn't even get into things like scientific realism, which I wanted to. I tried to stay away from the problem of evil as much as I could. We tried, yeah. 
I could tell you wanted to, and I want. I, I thought about it a few times too, but I was like, that's kind of a far afield here. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, but there, in dialectically, it's important to recognize the disagreement. We can all agree that you know certain versions of literalist Christianity are incompatible with findings of science, but there are further questions about science, its predictions, and various competing worldview theories. So um, there's a lot more to say here. So I think it's, it's important to highlight that the answer is not obvious, but there's you know we've seen two good cases. So. Um, yeah, as with those dialectical points, I'll sign us off and say thank you to my guests for being here. It's been a pleasure having you guys. Uh, so um, thanks again. Thank thanks you. for having us on. Thank Zachary, thanks for participating with this. I had a blast. It was great. Definitely a great discussion that I was looking forward to, and it did not fail to, to live up to the hype that I had for it, and I hope we can do this again soon. Great. All right. Appreciate you guys.